I see you've invited some interesting guests today. Tell me where you found about these. I'm not two sure people. where I found them, but they do very interesting work about Egypt. And uh, I think they're going to have a lot of insights about their work, about how they've started x-raying a bunch of mummies. And uh, I'm really looking forward to hearing what they have to say. You know, it's okay. a museum in, in Wales and, and uh, uh, they collaborate across the courtyard. One is a, a researcher who looks at, um, you know, machines uh, with an x-ray scanner, a CT scanner. And uh, one is a, a museum curator and they have a, a wonderful, uh, you know, collaboration. So we'll see what they have to say about it. Pretty interesting. So yeah, x-rays on a, on a never, never heard anything quite like this. So let's see what they have to say. Um, just really quickly, can you just tell us a little bit about how you started to work together, who you are and what you actually do? Yeah, so we're, we're both at Swansea University, Carolyn, um, as part of the Egypt Center, which is a museum on campus. And I was in the engineering department on the same campus. Those two buildings were opposite each other, um, very different fields, but separated by a kind of little pedestrian walkway. And I recently got um, an x-ray scanner. So, you know, had this technique that we, we use in material science and engineering to look inside structures and materials and things like jet engine parts, composite materials, traditional. So you're looking, so you're looking for uh, a, a part that's out of alignment or you're using the tool for something that explores what's inside an engine or something like that? Um, it's more like small parts. So you take a part from engineering, maybe you'd be looking for a crack or a defect or okay. something to do with its failure. Sometimes you're looking at an assembly of parts, but yeah, very, kind of engineering, material science focused. Okay. But, you know, having the capability to see inside things and an Egyptology museum just opposite, then I got in contact with someone I knew who, who worked with the Egypt Center and they, they put me in contact with Carolyn, uh, who was really up for trying stuff out with an x-ray scanner. Um, and so we met up and we looked through the museum, but then Carolyn said, oh, we've also got the store storeroom store area and so yeah we went down to the basement and and kind of started to look around at things that x-ray could reveal something that people haven't seen for thousands of years that was the idea really we've got this technique and what can we throw at it i guess what can we how can we bridge the gap between those two disciplines where one can really benefit the other so carolyn do you have when when you're studying is there a long history in wales of studying egyptian you know, uh, you know, artifacts? Strangely, there is. Now, why is another matter? It could be because of its um, biblical connections and lots of Welsh people being chapel goers, etc. But there have been some very well-known, well, well-known in Egyptological circles, Egyptologists in Wales, and some from Swansea as well, I mean, back to the 19th century. And um, Egyptology has been studied in Swansea, although not as a single honours degree, mm -hmm. um, for several years. So, so the part now, are you, because do you go on digs and pull things out? Like, what's your specialty? Sort of in the, the article I read, I felt like you looked at, like, you know, why, tried to piece together the history of something from looking at an artifact. Well, I'm a museum curator, so half my job is learning about Egyptology, if you like, and telling people about Egyptology and doing some research. And the other half is the looking after the objects bit, making sure they're safe, making sure that um, people can have access to them, sort of general museum work. Mm -hmm. So and, it's, it's and, a bit of both. And you have a lot of artifacts there, but in Egypt, there are... I mean, millions of artifacts. They are, yes, yes. Millions yeah, yeah. and millions of um, objects. My speciality is actually, it sounds boring, but I think it's very exciting, is on um, pharaonic flint tools. And, okay, and let's go deeper. What are those, what please? <laughs> um, well, you know how flint, the stone, the, the, the stone flint, or was used for tools. Mm -hmm. It was used in the pharaonic period right up until, well, probably about 300 BC, maybe even mm -hmm. a bit later than that. So the Reem flint tools, for example, were found in Tutankhamun's tomb. Mm -hmm. But not many people are interested in them. 
the what can we learn from the tools? Like, what is it that the tool, you know, understanding those tools, what did they say about the civilization? They tell us something about the religion because flint as a material was part of ancient Egyptian religion. It was thought of as being associated with the fiery goddesses who were the daughters of Ra. It was associated with storms and a very uh, chaotic or aggressive god called um, Seth. So it tells us about religion. It also tells us about everyday life as well how it was used. It was quite ubiquitous in Egypt, so you could easily pick it up, uh, whereas things like iron and copper were much more difficult, that the materials had to be imported more. Having said that, it does seem as if there was central control over flint mines and uh, quarries. So over the years, the museum acquired a lot of mummies, some of them quite small. I guess they were in the basement. So how did you, you know, Richard, like, how did it work? You found, like, what did you guys do? You, once you met, did you wander the basement and look for things that were a certain size? How did you come up with the criteria of what you were going to look at? We sort of did that. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. That's, you've got the right thing there. You know, so size was important. Um, so medical CT scanners have been around and used for years, but what we had was something that can give you much higher resolution. And so that's where we felt we could, you know, find something new or, or do something new. Now, so now looked, yeah. how important is that additional resolution for what you do, Carolyn? Well, to be honest, when Richard approached me, I had no idea what the resolution was going to look like. He, he sort of said, well, it's better than x-rays. So I thought, well, give it a try. I'm not, a, I'm not really a scientist and I'm still not 100% clear even what engineering is. Right. Uh, Right. So, 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 okay, so we're going to get to the, the 3D goggles when you first put those on, but, but what happened first? Like, so how did you pick these three things and, and what were they in? A, was it a state of, they were completely mummified and you were thinking, well, we're going to open them or we're never going to open them or what were you thinking before? Well, as a, as a museum curator, I wouldn't have really liked to open them because, of course, once they're opened, they're opened mm -hmm. and you probably lost evidence. It's, mm -hmm. it's a bit like excavation. It's sort of destructive once you've done it. And now that's sort of a new idea in archaeology, not to harm the things. I read an article about a Viking village they just found where they just found it by using radar. Is that sort of the thing? Is the sentiment now is not to disturb things? It's been gone around for many years, I'd say at least from the early 80s when I was a student, because we, we were set essays on this type of thing. Archaeology mm -hmm. is destruction, discuss, and this, this type of thing. Mm -hmm. um, so it's not, not really new. However, having said that, of course, people are really excited to know what's inside things, particularly exotics like mummies. So I think that sometimes overcomes their their worry about destroying evidence and that there have been a lot of unwrappings. I mean, even fairly recently, mm -hmm. these have been unwrapped. So these three things that you select, do you even know what's in them? Or are they just totally encased in, in bandages or whatever wrappings? Uh, we, we selected a few that we weren't sure of. Some of the things had been x-rayed in the past and so we had some idea of what was in there, but not a great deal of detail. Others, we hadn't really had x-rayed at all. So there's a mixture mm -hmm. of, of different items. And we did some really just to test to see how it was going to work. Now, um, now did you have to take them and walk across the courtyard to where the x-ray machine was? Yes. Now, yes. Was, that a, was that a worry or were you not worried about that at all? Always worried about transporting things. It's particularly on a university campus where there's right. all sorts of strange goings on with students wandering around and yeah. running around and bikes and all the rest of it. Uh, now, was this before COVID or was this during COVID? When oh no, COVID? this this was we started this years ago. Yeah. Can you remember what year it was, Richard? 2013. Yeah, 2013. I've got dates so, back to the right. first. Year. So was it um, whose students? took the stuff across the campus. They didn't. I wouldn't trust them to students. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you walked them over yourself? 
Yes, yes, I did. Um, I believe I had some help, at least with some of them. So sometimes there was two of us, one of us guarding the objects and the other doing the actual carrying. I mean, they're not heavy. Bits, right. So. How, how big are they, these objects, with all the wrappings and stuff? Were they... Were they... Well, I think Richard told me about the biggest that would go through would be a skull size. Okay. So it had to be generally. So that was the sort of size we were looking at and under. Is that so, correct, Richard? Yeah, so it, uh, about the biggest thing we could scan sensibly is a human head. Mm -hmm. um, and then you start to blur the lines between micro CT, which is the technique we use, and then medical CT. So around the size, the bigger something is, the lower the resolution. Um, so, so, so you're gonna you're used to doing parts, which are I imagine fairly simple uh, exercise. But now you're gonna have these other things come in. Do you have to do any special preparations for the the machine? You know, and change the the settings and 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 work on it. Like, how does it work? It's the same with anything new, actually. So you put something new in the machine, you're never really sure on the settings that you would need. And so, and that's why it was good to work quite closely with Carolyn and, and yeah. you know, the museum just opposite. So we were able to do that kind of with a view to, we're not sure how this is going to look, but we can try things. And, and, and so how long does it take? So you bring it over there, Carolyn, you have a sort of a low expectation of what might occur. You're just sort of taking a shot on it. How long before the first picture comes through? I think it was a few days before you contacted us, wasn't it? Well, because you weren't doing it full time. You had other things to do as well. So I had, to, I had to leave the objects in the engineering department. Is that scary? Were you worried about that? You look like you were a little concerned. Yes, I was always worried. And what was that moment when you saw the first the very first well, picture. Richard, what was the first moment you saw? Because you saw it early. So. Sure, yeah. yeah, so we see something almost straight away. So we put the any sample in and you get that 2D traditional kind of hospital type x-ray where the x-rays are shining through everything mm -hmm. and then you detect an image. And so straight away, I think it was the cat skull that was the first one or the head, the mummified head. And that was an example where we weren't really sure if there was anything in there. Um, which is is possible. There are plenty of examples of mummified mm. animals where there's there there are no remains inside. Mm -hmm. so a skull showed up really clearly. It was quite small compared to the overall size of the wrappings. So that was the first surprise. But it was like I'd never put anything like that in the machine before. And instantly, within you know a second of turning the X-rays on, we could see that it was a legitimate you know a cat skull or a skull within there. We couldn't tell. Exactly. Now, did you have to adjust the contrast and adjust? Did were there a whole bunch of things you had to do to it after you identified it? Yeah, there was. Um, so when we first set up the scan, hence why Carolyn had kind of handed them over, and and we do all of our bit with you know over in engineering. Yeah. And then for a full scan, which rather than just that two dimensional image, you get a three D um, perspective that takes anywhere between you know a couple of hours to. To a whole day for some samples but yeah around two to three hours for this one what why does it take more time to go from 2d to 3d that's a good question so what we have when you go to a hospital you have a 2d x-ray on your arm say broken arm that's an image that's through shining a x-ray through everything mm -hmm. and so that's why you see bright bits and dark bits the x-rays mm -hmm. are stopped by bone and pass through the rest if you were to take thousands of images while rotating either the camera or your arm then that's how you build up you get lots and lots of 2d projections mm -hmm. at different angles and then you reconstruct that into a 3d volume so the camera has to go around the object that's what it would be with medical scanning so that the big kind of ring the donut that people go into for a medical ct scan you're stationary and then the camera is spinning really really fast around you you can't see that because right. it's in the plastic housing but with ours the specimen is station uh, specimen spins and the camera and the x-ray source are stationary so carolyn do you, did you have during those few days when you didn't hear anything were you did you have were you anxious about what was going on over there or were you just like once once i'd sort of once they were settled and richard had reassured me that he would take very good care of them yeah. i trusted him then yeah. and and so you get a call and you walk over, do you remember, do you remember that moment when you first saw this, this uh, cat skull? 
well i was quite blown away by the the because i didn't really know what to expect or anything mm -hmm. but the incredible detail and i don't think the first one i saw was necessarily the best there was others that you worked on later mm -hmm. but yes it was quite fantastic to see see the results now now what is it what does it mean? Because you had, you had x-rays before, but this allows you to investigate much, a much deeper context to how the animal might have lived, how it died, and, and how, we, how we think about um, ancient Egypt and what their feelings towards their pets were, no? Yes, it does. Uh, all, all we had was an x-ray, so we knew what was probably in there. We didn't have x-rays of them all. Um, for example, the cat skull. I don't think we even knew whether there was hundred whether there was definitely a cat inside there because sometimes you do get things that look outwardly to be mummies and there's nothing actually in there. Um, so yes, it, it if, for the ones even where we got the X-rays, the the amount of detail on it. I mean, later on after contacting other experts. We were able to find out the cause of death of the animals, um, something about its life as well, uh, the, the fact that they weren't necessarily terribly well treated. Mm -hmm. uh, that's all that um, sort of stuff. Oh, I, mean, I don't know that Richard wants to talk more about that because you contacted all the experts in the different fields. And did you, did you find that, what did you find out about the, the cats? or you know about these animals and how they've been treated? The cat is an interesting one, um, it, and hence why we've been doing this project for so long. 2013 we started and I'm a material scientist so I'm used to breaking things and working out why they broke, but not necessarily thousands of years old mummified animals. And so we had, we could identify fractures in the skull mm -hmm. and we could measure some of the sizes, but you know, that that's anything further than that was outside of our expertise and, mm -hmm. and Collaboration is, is fun. This collaboration with Carolyn was fun. And so, you know, we tried to broaden that to bring in people who had expertise. So we, we brought in um, Dr. Richard Thomas or Professor Richard Thomas from Leicester University, who's a zoo archaeologist. And so whereas we'd been maybe for a couple of years, because this was kind of a side project in addition to everything else we had going on. Um, and we thought these fractures maybe were part of the, the cause of death for this, this cat. But actually bringing in the experts who know, who's used to looking at bones, bone fractures, they were instantly able to identify a lot of the fractures that we were looking at. And I've got three prints by the side yeah, of me yeah. that I can show. We're actually um, way, way after death. So, you know, you, they can usually tell if something is around the time of death based on the, the kind of shape of those bone fractures. Yeah. So these were really sharp, really oblique fractures, which suggested it was dry bone which obviously would happen years and years after death, probably in storage in the thousands of years since then. And so that ruled out some of those kind of markers where we thought, oh, that could be the cause of death. Uh -huh. But actually it led us down another path where um, something tiny that we wouldn't have noticed really in the data, Richard spotted. And it was the separation of vertebra in the neck, between the neck and the skull. And the outward packages seemed, or the outward wrapping seemed relatively intact when we looked at the x-ray data. And mm -hmm. so looking through the literature, there have been examples of kittens and cats that were, had their necks broken for mummification, but there'd never been this, this data at this kind of resolution of mm -hmm. a intact package. So, you know, the unwrapping is, as Carolyn said, it's really destructive. And so you would move all of these dry bones if you actually unwrapped. So the x-ray right. was showing us the position of those neck bones pretty much at the moment of mummification too. So yeah, that was an indicator that it was potentially strangled or had its neck broken. Yeah. Which is you know, really interesting then, because that gives you not just insight into the, the artifact that's sitting in a museum, it, it kind of is a glimpse back into the past of what happened around that time of death for that animal. <laughs> I mean, you know, does it, so the, a lot of the fractures that you saw were post-death, but they weren't necessarily, so we're not saying the cats were tortured or something, we're just saying that they were positioned in some way afterwards as a, as a, something to do with the deity? Like, what, why would they be doing that? Why were they mummifying all these animals anyways? There were, diff <laughs> there were different reasons for animal mummification. I mean, sometimes animals were mummified to accompany the dead in the afterlife. But these particular ones, 
because of um, the fact that more of these have been found than any others, we class them as votive offerings. That's not quite 100% true exactly what they are. They're, they're more sort of act as messengers between the gods and humans. So mm -hmm. when the animal is killed and made into a mummy, it makes it able to act as a go between between humans and the gods so that you would buy one of these animals it also by the way helped support the priesthood because you you're paying right. um mm. for the priests to mummify these animals for you so you buy one of these animals you give it with a prayer or a request to the god and it can act as a go between between the two because the animal itself is partly a divinity once it's been mummified mm -hmm. that's partly the purpose of mummification to change things into divine artifacts rather than just a dead corpse of a cat or snake or whatever it happens to what be. What was the significance of it like why the cat you know as opposed to well, or the cat the snake and the you know why you, you found that I think there were three animal different animals in the article maybe yeah. there were more but what, what was the significance of any of these animals like like Priscilla is saying? It seems to be that the animals were chosen in this, according to whichever temple that they were offered at, whichever god was in charge of that temple. So if it was a goddess, for example, there's a, there's a goddess called Bastet, who is a cat goddess, and she's often portrayed with the, the head of a cat rather than looking like a complete cat. It would be likely the cats would be offered to her. There's another god called Sobek, who has a crocodile head, and so you'd offer crocodiles to him and so on and so forth. And the crocodiles, of course, wouldn't fit in the scanner. We did, we did have a little crocodile, a little baby one. Right. Um, but he, he was a bit big to go in the scanner, even though he was only a baby. Now, did you, do you remember where you got these mummies from? Did they, do you remember where they were buried? Like who they were buried with, that kind of thing? Um, the, most of our collection was collected in Victorian times. It's, it's very difficult to get stuff out of Egypt for good reasons now. I mean, we don't want people going looting things, taking things from other countries. Uh, so most of the stuff in collections in, in the UK and also in America and other places are the result of Victorian collections, which ours largely was collected by somebody. Ours were collected largely by somebody called Sir Henry Welcome. The mm. pharmacist that made lots of money from aspirin right. and um, he didn't tend to record exactly where he got things from he used to often buy them at auctions as well and the auctioneer wasn't necessarily all that in, um, interested in where the animal comes from so much as what it is because collectors ideas have changed as to what they're interested in do we understand how people felt about, were any of these animals that you found pets and were they, you know, you said they were, so these were all just treated poorly and, and um, you know, is, I mean, what is your insights about how the animals lived their lives? Well, Richard was able to find out quite a bit about um, how some of the animals were kept when they were alive, believe it or not, which I was really surprised that you could do that. So. Now, was this a different expert, Richard, that you reached out, or was it the same, the, the zoo, zoological archaeologist? Uh, so for the cat, we, we worked with Professor Richard Thomas, um, and then we, the snake sample, which actually doesn't really look like a snake from the mummified wrappings. It just looks like a ball of rags, effectively. There's, it, if you didn't know, if you hadn't seen the x-ray, then you wouldn't really guess there's a snake mm. inside, but the x-rays revealed there were. And so we worked with Dr. Reese Jones from Cardiff University, who is a biologist and herpetologist. And the aim initially with that was to look at, try and get a species identification, because that would be really, whereas, you know, a cat um, was a bit more obvious, but a snake is really, really tricky. And it's, it's a surprisingly small snake. It, you kind of lose perspective when you, you're in x-ray data. It's 3D, it's mm -hmm. a volume. Um, and we can 3D print that to large scale and help with analysis. But actually, it's about the size of my thumbnail, the, the mm. snake skull. So it was mm. a juvenile. And even if you had the actual skull, it would be really difficult to, to do species ID. But we were able to scale that up, 3D print it. So all those features and ridges and things you would use to identify species were a lot larger for, 
for Reese to look at. And so he identified that to be an Egyptian cobra. Mm -hmm. But there was some, some other fascinating things. So we, we think we've identified cause of death within that snake as well. And, and I did a lot of kind of Googling over the years. That's why it's, it's evolved. It's certainly evolved. The scans were done years ago, but having the time to delve into those and work with other people um, really kind of brought new, new insight out. And what, so when I, what did you find out about the snake, uh, the snake's death? So we think, and Reese, who works across the world in different countries handling snakes, has experienced this as well and seen people using this technique to this day, but almost like a bull whipping. So whipping a snake effectively severs the vertebra, so puts a displacement there and, and, and kills the snake. And I didn't know that. There's no way I would have known that. But and there's no academic literature. I'd been searching, searching and searching. Um, but Was this, was this oh. snake killed? as another guest in the go-between or is this a different scenario right like so this is not a mummified this was not a snake that was like going to like you know help me talk to somebody when I'm gone or we don't know that it would have been mummy it was mummified so it was made into a go-between okay. um whether or not it was bred on the um the temple site is another matter, but Richard was able to find out some evidence which suggested that it had been dehydrated, which suggests it was maybe kept in captivity. So it could have, is that right, Richard? Yeah, so this was years and years after the scans, delving into the 3D data and finding something that didn't kind of sit right. We see bone, even if something's dried thousands of years later, bone shows up really, really well. Uh, some desiccated soft tissue, but then there was something else in there that was standing out. And it took a lot of research to, and looking at kind of journals publishing things about animals or reptiles kept in captivity mm. that show when they are deprived fluids and water, they can generate uh, or effectively their kidneys calcify. So it's like a form of gout. Mm. And so that is what I was seeing within this two th over 2000 year old package. And so this snake potentially was kept with either a little amount of water, but effectively dehydrated to quite a significant, significant extent. The, the kidneys were fully calcified. They, yeah. they had structure. You could see the shape of the kidney just in that calcified tissue. Did they know what, like why you would, what would be the significance of a snake versus a cat? Like what, you know, what they may, how they may protect you, how the message may be, you know, is, did you get more into the symbolism of what the choice is there? No, uh, it, they don't seem to have had different symbols for different mummified animals, as far as we know. I mean, the, the Egyptians didn't write down all the detail. We think we know a lot about ancient Egypt, but there's a lot we don't know. But there doesn't seem to have been anything hugely different in what you would ask from each different god. So much so, in fact, that some Egyptologists argue that very often, one god is a uh, just another variation of another god so it, you don't need to get too hung up on which particular god it is that you are worshiping if if you like because the they're all not exactly the same there are variations but it also could be that the the god the animal that they personify also shows the type of character of that type of god and the, the god might even change from one animal into another as its character changes. There are stories, for example, about um, uh, an aggressive goddess called Sekhmet who changes into a, a gentle cow goddess. Um, in, so, you know, so don't worry too much about the fact that they're totally different gods. Right. You know, the, um, the, is it important that you, you can keep studying this data now? You know, you don't have to, you, you, it, it's like you've scanned it, you've scanned it at high resolution. I imagine they're huge files. Do you ever have to even open the wrappings? I hope we don't have to. Yeah, um, I see a reason why we would. I think it's not I just- mean, Would you ever even have to rescan them? I mean, technology always moves onwards. And so we would never want to do anything. I think that's the reason why x-raying was so useful in that you know, as a researcher, we're here for a period of time for our careers or our lives. And so any artifacts that have been around for thousands of years, we don't want to do anything that means the next generation of researchers, scientists, or just the public can't interact with them. 
in the same way that we were able to and people before us. So it's, yeah, I think it's really important as a technique, this reduces the probability that you would need to unwrap things and do destructive techniques. I, I'm so curious if there's been a comparison, like if you're taking this, how old, okay, how old is the, the cat skull, right? And then have you done comparisons with contemporary cats now or cats of that, with that lineage perhaps, even from the same part of the world? And what's the evolutionary process if there has been one? We, we haven't, and that, that was kind of a thought when, when you're doing uh, measurements of the skull to try and look at species. But you know, we're talking about quite a short amount of time in, in the grand scheme of things, a couple of thousand years. But yeah, I think we could tell the species, but I think looking at more um, evolutionary changes is probably too short a time to go. For that particular species, obviously it depends. If you're thinking about something like dogs, then it may be very different. Did, now, where are the these samples now? Are they back in the museum? Yes, they are. Yes. Now, Carolyn, you have all this data on things that, you know, you didn't have before. Will will this work that you guys have been doing go into exhibits in the in the museum? It already has. Uh, the snake mummy, for example, we were able to get a, a grant because we're such a small museum, so we have to get grants to do everything. We were able to get a grant to do a sort of 3D hologram to show the snake coming out of its mummy. Um, so people, it, 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 we really used the hologram as a way to get people to look at the actual science and the object. A little bit more closely but I think people got quite excited by the hologram as well. So it is on display and Richard had also done a 3D printout as well, a larger than life 3D printout of the, the, the snake skull and we put that on display with the snake itself too. How did you do the, the, the printout Richard? Was it through a 3D printer or was it did you have to go through some other process? Yeah, so we have 3D printers in the lab kind of next to the x-ray machine. So it's a really common technique, uh, almost straightforward for us now. It's easier for me to 3D print than 2D print these days. Mm -hmm. um, I don't own a 2D paper printer. Mm -hmm. um, so we, we take the data and we can just reproduce, uh, reproduce that data and the surface file into the shape what of is, the skull. What is that I mean, one? Is? Which one is that? So this is, uh, I'm showing on the webcam at the moment, a, this is the cat skull, but it's scaled up. This is, um, I think, around two times the size. So it actually looks quite large, but the yeah. real cat skull was, in fact, a kitten, so it was a lot smaller. When you um, showed the things to the researchers, did they look at them in VR? Because I saw that you had some virtual reality things, so that were there ways of making these things bigger so that, I mean, Carolyn, did you look at them that way? So that yes, they were so bigger than you, you thought they would be? Were they bigger than I thought they would be? Well, I didn't really know what to expect at all from, from the, the scans. It was a lot more detail than I thought there would be, certainly. Um, and the printouts that Richard did for us mean that we can, we can actually hand the skulls and other things around for people to have a look at and they can see them closely because they're bigger than they are in real life. What's okay. that Richard? What do you so have? This is the snake skull but this is 10 times larger but wow. the detail is incredible within that. So remember I mentioned it was about the size of my thumbnail whereas right. now it's bigger than my hand and yeah. that really helps identify some of those kind of cranial features that would help identify the species. But again, as Carolyn says, there's, there's greater value. You, know, you have this thousands of years old mummified package. People can't touch that and it doesn't look anything like a snake, but it's interesting. And then all of a sudden you take what's inside there, 3D print that and people can you know, quite handle that. It's quite robust. And so, you know, there's, there's plenty more study to do that could be revealed by people handling this, I think. And, no, we Although if they, if they dropped it, it wouldn't really matter, right? You just print another one. Print another one, yeah. Yeah, this one's a bit bashed up because we've used it for outreach and kids get hold of it. And But again, like you say, it's fine, you know, if they break you it know, off. You know, Carolyn, when kids come in and look at these things and they handle them and, and you know, has it, is it, does it make the, the metaphor for ancient Egypt stronger? Do kids see it and be like, wow, what is that? And 
does it ignite their imagination, these new tools it, and these ideas? Yes, it does. I mean, even seeing the actual ancient object certainly makes it a lot more real than just learning about it in books. Um, but being able to, I think the closer you can get to things, and we can't allow them to physically handle these. We mm. do allow them to physically handle some other things, but obviously not the mummified remains because it's too fragile. It does help make things more real. It sort of, um, I think handling things sort of puts you magically in touch. That's not quite the right phrase because I don't believe in magic, but somehow you feel more emotionally involved with the object and it makes it seem more real. You know, studying um, Egypt, you know, I mean, Richard, at a, at a base level, was your curiosity about ancient Egypt and you know, Carolyn, where does your curiosity about it come from? Because it's you've been studying it a long time. Why do we, why do we study it? Why was, why is it important that we we look at, back at this time? For me, um, it, I it, it was a museum that was on campus, and I have an X-ray machine, and so it was <laughs> a curiosity to see the inside of everything yeah. that's around me. So I I find myself picking things up off the beach and and. Yeah, you know, there's a reason that unboxing videos are so popular on YouTube where it's just a video of someone opening a box, but everyone's curious about what's inside the box, right? And and that's the same with everything around us. I just always think, what's inside there? And most of the time, you might be the first person to ever see the inside of something. And in particular, with this example, we knew we were going to be the first people for thousands of years to see the inside mm -hmm. of the packages so that was the fascination for me and that curiosity is always with me and that's why i'm always kind of putting things in the machine i allow curiosity time on our x-ray machines for for the group so if they have things that they come across and find and you never know where these things will lead and so yeah it's this was a really almost like the perfect application of the methodology really and the, the technique in terms of seeing something new, but also for other people to be interested in it, because there is that fascination with ancient Egypt. Um, I think as well, the, the life and death of the animals also allows us to draw some comparison with the way animals are treated in the present day as well. Because the first reaction when you read what the work that Richard has done on it is, in some ways it was if you like terribly cruel what happened and there were these these mummies were mass produced and there were millions and millions of animals killed and given to the gods and your first reaction was oh isn't this terrible we don't do that type of thing today etc and then you think hang on factory farming yes we do and yet we have other animals as pe as pets so it's a, we have a two two-faced if you like attitude to animals in the same way that you might argue that the egyptians did too um, so there's the, there, the possibility of, so it does tell us something about, I think, about humanity today in the present day as well. So we haven't and, really changed then. <laughs> so we haven't in changed. some ways, no, we haven't really changed. Yeah. Uh, as, a, as a museum curator, I'm but struck by that time and time again. And also, I think it's, I know Richard is perhaps more interested in the curiosity of opening things as he explained yes i'm interested in that as well but one of the reasons why i'm interested in um past people is because they were human too and just because somebody in a civilization or a person is long dead doesn't mean they cease suddenly to be meaningful and um in a, in a way we sort of I was going to say bringing them back to life, but not in not like the mummy film. We're not down in the basement doing spells or anything like that. Uh, I have one one thought before we have to sign off. But you know, it is interesting. So when when people come through and they look at this and they see the kind of what we're what I'm interpreting as this violence or cruelty or whatever, right? Is it are there are there ever questions around that? Reflections? Do you think people kind of have a moment? and just think about that? Does, do you think that there's something else that might happen when you have that experience and you're kind of learning more holistically about what happened? Just, I'm, I'm really looking for, you know, does it, does it make one pause? Just like, you, just like you just articulated basically for yourself. Have you seen that with, with visitors that come in? Yes, it does, yes. Because often they will then go on to talk about modern treatment of animals. I mean, Rick, 
I knew something about ancient Egyptian treatment of animals anyway, but this sort of reinforces it. It makes it more real when you've got a per personal is not quite the right word when it's an animal, but you've got a single animal that you know so much detail about. Right. So for those who've been listening and watching today, is there like a, a you are a, they can go and look at this work um, online? Is there a way to look? Um, so there's videos. Also, we talked about the data for 3D printing. That's actually available. 3D printing is kind of everywhere. Schools have them. So, so people can print out their own versions of the skull and or the cat skull and the, the snake skull. But also, they, can, they don't have to 3D print that data. The data is there to interrogate, move around. Mm -hmm. We talked about virtual reality. So you can put those files. If people have virtual reality goggles, they can make them as big as a building, you know, have this skull as big as a building, walk around, investigate it, maybe see something that we haven't seen. You know, there's a, yeah, there's a limit. The data's around you know, the same size as I always talk about it as an analogy within a computer game. So every x-ray scan has about the same amount of data as a Grand Theft Auto. And people walk around those streets for months you know, investigating. Yeah. And so you can do the same with x-ray data. You can get lost in there. You can see something new every time. It would um, be great to redirect people's efforts from Grand Theft Auto to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you guys. It's been a lovely, lovely conversation and just appreciate you sharing these, the insights from the work that you've done. And, uh, you know, you know, just uh, very happy that you were here with us. Appreciate it. Thank you. Stay dry, yeah. Stay dry and warm over there. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, that, was, that was really, really interesting. Yeah, really I thought so too. I mean, yeah. it's, it's, it's just a, the idea, though, I, I, for me, what's interesting is, you know, getting people to be exploring that way and starting mm -hmm. to use those techniques, yeah. to be interested in things in, you know, in science, in archaeology, it, it, it's kind of compelling. But I'm curious about the differences, what we could begin to understand. Yeah. Which, human nature hasn't changed much, though, sadly. Yeah, I agree with you. Well, right. it, was, uh, it was great to spend some time with them, so... Okay, well, I'll see you on the next one. All right.